evening, everyone. We'll call this study session to order. We'll start with roll call, please. Here. 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 Now is the time for public appearances. So if there's anyone in the audience who would like to address the commission about a subject not on the study session agenda, we would ask that you step to the podium. Seeing no movement, we will move on to the main item of tonight's agenda. That is the principles of vexillology, or in English, the city flag project proposal. And this project was actually brought to me by Carter Demeray, uh, who is the YHS school body president and who also qualified for nationals in domestic extemp over the weekend. So congratulations. So I would just, to get us started off, like Carter to step to the podium and tell us about how he got interested in this subject and why he thought it would be a good one for the community to tackle. Um, good evening, everyone. I'll just first off start by thanking um, the City Commission for having an interest in this um, as well and for inviting me here uh, to come and speak. Um, I first uh, became kind of inspired by a city flag process, uh, really by Sioux Falls. Um, because within the past few years they um, have a city flag now and they went through a whole process of getting a city flag and while it's not everywhere in Sioux Falls there are places I have seen where at homes people will have the city flag flying I've seen it on bumper stickers I've seen it in other areas in Sioux Falls um, and then I did a bit of research on it and I see I've seen that there are other areas nationwide thousands of cities as well as there are some other cities in South Dakota that also have a city flag um, even Brandon Valley last year has a city flag that was designed by three third graders. Um, so I thought that it's just a really interesting um, idea and would be a cool process to go through in the community because I think um, a city flag could be kind of a symbol of pride for our community because Yankton is a, a very unique um, place and so I think we need a, a, just a symbol to represent um, our uniqueness to people, especially if they come here every year to go camping or to riverboat days, they can be like, oh, that's the Yankton flag if they see it. So it's just a symbol that people um, know when they see it. And it's also something that the community can work on together and just be a cool project uh, that the community can work on. And it's also something that I've seen interest in uh, by youth, um, not only in high school, but also in uh, elementary school and elementary schools. Uh, in the high school I've talked with other students, uh, mainly people who are more artistic than me, and they definitely do have an interest in something like this. And uh, my little sister, she's in fifth grade, and when I first told her about this, she's already designing city flags and giving them to me. So I think it's definitely something that if we involve um, the youth in and the schools in, that it's something that they would be willing to participate in, as well as, of course, uh, the rest of the community as well. And so yeah, I just think it would be um, a cool idea for Yankton uh, to go forward with. Thanks, Carter. Does anyone have any questions for Carter before we move on? I'm sure Carter will be involved with us throughout the process. So thanks again for bringing that idea to us. And here we are today to look into it further. And we have some great city staff who have been studying the subject and have uh, presentation for us tonight and will maybe give us some ideas on how to proceed if we wish to proceed. Jolly, please lead us. Thanks again and I wanted to again congratulate Carter on making or making to the National Debate Tournament in Domestic Extemp. Seven years ago I qualified in the same same event so I'm getting old but also I see that you know you're, you're getting up there as well so going up to college. <laughs> Oh, oh. I feel for you getting old. Oh. <laughs> oh, jeez. All right. So this is just going to be an educational session where we're going to introduce the idea of vexillology. I know it's hard to pronounce, but it's basically the study of flag, the history of flags, and kind of understanding the, the meanings and the underlying 
uh, are the underpinnings behind why a city would go in and incorporate a flag. So we're going to start off with a little uh, TED talk by Roman Mars, which kind of illustrates uh, what a good flag looks like, but also what some of the not so good flags look like in the country. So just a short video. And I also want to mention that there might be a expletive in this video. So I know what you're thinking, but why does that guy get to sit down? That's because this is radio. I tell radio stories about design, and I report on all kinds of stories, buildings and toothbrushes, mascots, wayfinding and fonts. My mission is to get people to engage with the design that they care about so they begin to pay attention to all forms of design. When you decode the world with design intent in mind, the world becomes kind of magical. Instead of seeing the broken things, you see all the little bits of genius that anonymous designers have sweated over to make our lives better. And that's essentially the definition of design, making life better and providing joy. And few things give me greater joy than a well-designed flag. Yeah. Happy 50th anniversary on your flag, Canada. It is beautiful, gold standard. Love it. I'm kind of obsessed with flags. Sometimes I bring up the topic of flags, and, and uh, people are like, I, I, don't, I don't care about flags. And, and then we start talking about flags, and trust me, 100% of people care about flags. There's just something about them that works on our emotions. My family wrapped my Christmas presents as flags this year, and including the uh, blue uh, gift bag that's dressed up as the, as the flag of Scotland. I, I put this picture online, and, and sure enough, within the first few minutes, someone left a comment that said, you can take that Scottish salt tire and shove it up your ass. <laughs> Which, see, people are passionate about flags, you know? That's the way it is. What I love about flags is that once you understand the design of flags, what makes a good flag, what makes a bad flag, you can understand the design of almost anything. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to kind of crack open an episode of my radio show, 99% Invisible, and I'm going to reconstruct it here on stage. So when I, when I press a button over here... S for sound. It's going to make a sound. And so whenever you hear a sound or a voice or a piece of music, it's because I pressed a button. All right. Got it? Here we go. Three, two. This is 99% Invisible. I'm Roman Mars. The five basic principles of flag design. According to the North American Vexillological Association. Vexillological. Vexillology is the study of flags. It's that extra law that makes it sound weird. Number one, keep it simple. The flag should be so simple that a child can draw it from memory. Before I moved to Chicago in 2005, I didn't even know cities had their own flags. Most larger cities do have flags. Well, I didn't know that. That's Ted Kay, by the way. Hello. He's a flag expert. He's a totally awesome guy. I'm Ted Kay. I have edited a scholarly journal on flag studies, and I'm currently involved with the Portland Flag Association and the North American Vexillological Association. Ted literally wrote the book on flag design. Good flag, bad flag. It's, it's more of a pamphlet, really. It's about 16 pages. Yes, it's called Good Flag, Bad Flag, How to Design a Great Flag. And that first city flag I discovered in Chicago is a beaut. White field, two horizontal blue stripes, and four six-pointed red stars down the middle. Number two. Use meaningful symbolism. The blue stripes represent the water, the river, and the lake. The flag's images, colors, or patterns should relate to what it symbolizes. The red stars represent significant events in Chicago's history. Namely, the founding of Fort Dearborn on the future site of Chicago, the Great Chicago Fire, the World Columbian Exposition, which everyone remembers because of the White City, and the Century of Progress Exposition, which no one remembers at all. Number three, use two to three basic colors. The basic rule for colors is to use two to three colors from the standard color set, red, white, blue, green, yellow, and black. 
The design of the Chicago flag has complete buy-in with the entire cross-section of the city. It is everywhere. Every municipal building flies the flag. Like, there's probably at least one store in every block near where I work that sells some sort of Chicago flag paraphernalia. That's Wet Moser from Chicago Magazine. Today, just for example, I went to get a haircut, and when I sat down on the barber's chair, there was a Chicago flag on the box that the barber has kept all his tools in, and then in the mirror, there was a Chicago flag on the wall behind me. When I left, a guy passed me who had a Chicago flag badge on his backpack. It's adaptable and remixable. The six-pointed stars in particular show up in all kinds of places. The coffee I bought the other day had a Chicago star on it. It's a distinct symbol of Chicago pride. When a police officer or a firefighter dies in Chicago, often it's not the flag of the United States on his casket. It can be the flag of the city of Chicago. That's how deeply the flag has gotten into the civic imagery of Chicago. And it isn't just that people love Chicago and therefore love the flag. I also think that people love Chicago more because the flag is so cool. A positive feedback loop there between great symbolism and civic pride. Okay, so when I moved back to San Francisco in 2008, I researched its flag because I had never seen it in the previous eight years I lived there. And I found it, I am sorry to say, sadly lacking. I know. It hurts me too. Well, let me start from the top. Number one, keep it simple. Keeping it simple. The flag should be so simple that a child can draw it from memory. It's a relatively complex flag. (sighs) Okay, here we go. Okay, the main component of the San Francisco flag is a phoenix, representing the city rising from the ashes after the devastating fires of the 1850s. A powerful symbol for San Francisco. I still don't really dig the Phoenix. Design-wise, it manages to both be too crude and have too many details at the same time, which if you were trying for that, you wouldn't be able to do it. (laughs) And it just looks bad at a distance. But having deep meaning puts that element in the plus column. Behind the Phoenix, the background is mostly white. And then it has a substantial gold border around it. Which is a very attractive design element. I think it's okay, but... Here come the big no-nos of flag design. Number four, no lettering or seals. Never use writing of any kind. Underneath the phoenix, there's a motto on a ribbon that translates to gold in peace, iron in war, plus. And this is the big problem. It says San Francisco across the bottom. If you need to write the name of what you're representing on your flag, your symbolism has failed. The United States flag doesn't say, like, USA across the front. In fact, country flags, you know, they tend to behave. So, like, hats off to South Africa and Turkey and Israel and Somalia and Japan and Gambia. There's a bunch of really great country flags. But they obey good design principles because the stakes are high. They're on the international stage. But city, state, and regional flags are another story. There is a scourge of bad flags, and they must be stopped. (laughs) That is the truth, and that is the dare. The first step is to recognize that we have a problem. A lot of people tend to think that good design is just a matter of taste, and you know, and quite honestly, sometimes it is, actually, but sometimes it isn't, all right? Here's the full list of NAVA flag design principles. The five basic principles of flag design. Number one. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Number two. Use meaningful symbolism. Number three. Use two to three basic colors. Number four. No lettering or seals. Never use writing of any kind. Because you can't read that at a distance. Number five. And be distinctive. All the best flags tend to stick to these principles. And like I've said before, like most country flags are okay. But here's the thing. If you showed this list of principles to any designer of almost anything, they would say these principles, simplicity, deep meaning, uh, having few colors or being thoughtful about colors, uniqueness, don't have writing, you can't read, all those principles apply to them too. But sadly, good design principles are rarely invoked in U.S. city flags. Our biggest problem seems to be that fourth one. We just can't stop ourselves from putting our names on our flags or like little 
municipal seals with tiny writing on them. Here's the thing about municipal seals. They were designed to be on pieces of paper where you can read them, not on flags 100 feet away flapping in the breeze. So here's a bunch of flags again. Uh, Vexillologists call these SOBs, seals on a bed sheet. And if, if, if you can't tell what city they go to, yeah, that's, that's exactly the problem, except for Anaheim, apparently, they, they fixed it. Uh, uh, these flags are everywhere in the US. The European equivalent of the municipal seal is the, is the city coat of arms. And this is where we can learn a lesson for how to do things right. So this is the city coat of arms of Amsterdam. Now, if this were a United States city, the flag would probably look like this. You know. You know. Uh, but instead, the flag of Amsterdam looks like this. Rather than plopping the whole coat of arms on a solid background and writing Amsterdam below it, they just take the key elements of the escutcheon, the shield, and they turn it into the most badass city flag in the world. And, and because it's so badass, those flags and crosses are found throughout Amsterdam, just, just like Chicago we used. Even though a seal on a bedsheet flags are particularly painful and offensive to me, uh, nothing can quite prepare you for one of the biggest train wrecks in vexillological history. Are you ready? It's the flag of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I mean, it's, it's distinctive. Uh, I'll give them that. It was adopted in 1955. Uh, the city ran a contest and gathered a bunch of submissions with all kinds of designs. And an alderman by the name of Fred Steffen cobbled together parts of the submissions to make what is now the Milwaukee flag. It's a kitchen sink flag. There's a gigantic gear representing industry. There's a ship recognizing the port. A giant stalk of wheat paying homage to the brewing industry. It's a hot mess. And Steve Kotis, a graphic designer from Milwaukee, wants to change it. It is. It's, it's really awful. It's a misstep on the city's behalf, to say the least. <laughs> but what puts the Milwaukee flag over the top, almost to the point of self-parody, is on it is a picture of the Civil War battle flag of the Milwaukee Regiment. So that's the final element in it that just makes it that much more sort of ridiculous that there is, you know, a flag design within the on design the of flag. the yeah. Milwaukee flag. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Milwaukee is a fantastic city. I've been there. I love it. The most depressing part of this flag, though, is that there have been two major redesign contests. The last one was held in 2001. 105 entries were received. But in the end, the members of the Milwaukee Arts Board decided that none of the new entries were worthy of flying over the city. They couldn't agree to change that thing. That's discouraging enough to make you think that good design and democracy just simply do not go together. But Steve Kotis is going to try one more time to redesign the Milwaukee flag. I believe Milwaukee is a great city. Every great city deserves a great flag. Steve isn't ready to reveal his design yet. One of the things about proposing one of these things is you have to like get people on board and then you reveal your design. But here's the trick. If you want to design a great flag, a kick-ass flag like Chicago's or DC's, which also has a great flag, start by drawing a one by one and a half inch rectangle on a piece of paper. Your design has to fit within that tiny rectangle. Here's why. A three by five foot flag on a pole 100 feet away looks about the same size as a one by one and a half inch rectangle seen about 15 inches from your eye. You'll be surprised at how compelling and simple the design can be when you hold yourself to that limitation. Meanwhile, back in San Francisco, is there anything we can do? I like to say that in every bad flag, there's a good flag trying to get out. The way to make San Francisco's flag a good flag is to take the motto off, because you can't read that at a distance. Take the name off, and the border might even be made thicker, so it's more a part of the flag. And I would simply take the phoenix and make it a great big element in the middle of the flag. With the current phoenix, that's got to go. 
I would simplify or stylize the phoenix, depict a big wide-winged bird coming out of flames, emphasize those flames. So this San Francisco flag was designed by Frank Camaro based on Ted Kay's suggestions. I don't know what he would do if he was completely unfettered and, and didn't, have, didn't follow those guidelines. Fans of my radio show and podcast, they've heard me complain about bad flags. They've sent me other suggested designs. This one's by Neil Musset. Both are so much better. <laughs> and I think if they were adopted, I would see them around the city in my crusade to make flags of the world more beautiful. Many listeners have taken it upon themselves to redesign their flags and look into the feasibility of getting them officially adopted. If you see your city flag and like it, fly it. Even if it violates a design rule or two, I don't care. But if you don't see your city flag, maybe it doesn't exist, but maybe it does, and it just sucks. And I dare you to join the effort to try to change that. As we move more and more into cities, the city flag will become not just a symbol of that city as a place, but also it could become a symbol of how that city considers design itself. Especially today, as the populace is becoming more design aware, and I think design awareness is at an all-time high, a well-designed flag could be seen as an indicator of how a city considers all of its design systems, its public transit, its parks, its signage. It might seem frivolous, but it's not. Often when city leaders say, we have more important things to do than worry about a city flag, my response is, if you had a great city flag, you would have a banner for people to rally under to face those more important things. I've seen firsthand what a good city flag can do in the case of Chicago. The marriage of good design and civic pride is something that we need in all places. The best part about municipal flags is that we own them. They are an open source, publicly owned design language of the community. When they are done well, they are remixable, adaptable, and they are powerful. We could control the branding and graphical imagery of our cities with a good flag, but instead, by having bad flags we don't use, we cede that territory to sports teams and chambers of commerce and tourism boards. Sports teams can leave and break our hearts. Besides, some of us you know, don't really care about sports. And tourism campaigns can just be cheesy. But a great city flag is something that represents a city to its people, and its people to the world at large. And when that flag is a beautiful thing, that connection is a beautiful thing. So maybe all the city flags can be as inspiring as Hong Kong or Portland or Trondheim. And we can do away with all the bad flags like San Francisco, Milwaukee, Cedar Rapids. And finally, when we're all done, we can do something about Pocatello, Idaho, considered by the North American Vexillological Association as the worst city flag in North America. <laughs> That thing has a trademark symbol on it, people. That, that hurts me just to look at. Thank you so much for listening. makes a good flag, keeping it simple so that a third grader can draw the flag, but also the meaning is not something that is complex that someone from the city would not be able to recognize. Secondly, that ties into the using meaningful symbolism and then using two or three basic colors. On the brochure, you'll see that there are some uh, city flags that have four or five colors, but also they fit kind of the majority of the guidelines, so they're also viewed as good flags as well. And then at the end, we'll test ourselves on a flag uh, on, uh, that includes writing and seals, and we'll see if it's a good flag or not. So uh, I think after that, we can go to uh, the next slide. So I just wanted to do a 
kind of recap of a, an article that I read by Ted Kay, who, who was mentioned by the TED Talk. He's one of the leading vexillologists of uh, NAVA, the North American Vexillological Association. So he did a meta-study of cities that incorporated flag design and redesign efforts from 2015 to 2017. And there were about 12 uh, main uh, results that he found, but I took out the ones that focused on redesign efforts, since we're only focusing on flag design efforts. So the first one is approval from elected officials greatly increases the likelihood of successful adoption. Um, that is, is pretty intuitive. If the, if the commissioners or if the city council of a city were not in support of us pursuing any sort of public outreach or public consultants on having a city flag, then it would, it would defeat the purpose. Secondly, attempts to create flags for cities without existing flags fare, fare better than replacing one. I think the example of San Francisco when they tried to replace their flag in 2001 didn't go over well because uh, many things, but one I think that could be important was community participation on the first creation of the flag. If there were some community members that gravitated towards, even though it did not look as appealing towards Roman Mars, they probably thought that that flag had some kind of resonation with them. So um, having flag design efforts and doing it right the first way can help us avoid going back and me 10 years later with gray hair looking in the newspaper and seeing that Yankton's doing a redesign effort on a flag, avoiding that situation would be beneficial. Uh, third, providing guidance on flag design principles leads to better designs. Again, we've got the five principles that was mentioned in the podcast, but also on the NAVA database. They've got guidelines, they've got principles that we can utilize that are simple to incorporate into a flag, and it's been successful as we look at you know, which flags are good versus which ones are bad in the brochure. Uh, fourth is community participation versus individual participation. I think that's one of the biggest things that we should consider. It shouldn't be something that is just the city staff or the city departments that want to have a city flag. It should be the community and what ideas or methods of symbolism resonate with them. So if it's the, if it's the bridge, if it's the downtown area, it's something that the community members should decide. Uh, fifth is student, involves, student involvement advances the cause. Carter. Uh, makes a good case with his little sister who's already starting to make designs for us. It's something that if we can involve the schools and, and those uh, and the Yangtonians around the community, if we can just get them to either make designs or at least contribute in a study committee of community members, they can come in and join and just explain what kind of flag resonates with them, what kind of designs do they think represents Yankton, and so forth. And then six uh, is that smaller cities have more success due to community impact. I think that's just we can get more people, we can involve more people in the process, we can get more outreach, social media posts that target our community members more successfully than a city as large as, as New York City. It would be a little bit more difficult to get community impact and community participation that way. Seventh is uh, building public support uh, leads to a more successful campaign. Again, that ties back into community participation. If we lead a, a successful campaign by uh, involving the uh, Meridian Arts Council, the Yankton Area Arts, getting them in the process, I think that would be beneficial for us because it would show that there is an interest in the city flag and it's not just our, our uh, city staff's end. Uh, eight is most contemporary flag change efforts employ social media. We can use our, our uh, city uh, social media, Twitter account, Facebook account, Instagram, anything that we can incorporate to kind of gauge interest. Also, there's the potential for us to speak on a radio talk show, go in and, and speak to the media. So there are, are ways and methods out there that we can to start gauging the public's interest. And then finally, the process can take longer than expected. So anywhere from a few months to over, a, over uh, two years. So Sioux Falls, for example, their process ended up taking uh, well over a year. They had uh, increased public interest and then it kind of fluctuated over time but they were able to get uh, Ted Kay to come in on a little phone interview and kind of discuss the flag design process that, this, that Sioux Falls could incorporate and I think if there was any way that we can uh, get that kind of information from Ted Kay that would be beneficial. Again Zach DeBoer was also uh, an individual that influenced the city flag efforts in Brandon and in Sioux Falls so there are methods out there that we can uh, kind of incorporates kind of lessen the amount of time and kind of also focus on the improvements and the participation of the community. So in conclusion, again, feedback from the community is key. On our little uh, one-page uh, sheet that you, you received for this agenda for the work session, we discussed the idea of a study committee. Again, that I believe should be composed of solely community members. If we contact, again, Yankton Area Arts and Meridian's Arts Council, maybe someone from the Yankton County Historical Society, I think that would be beneficial for us because they would have an idea of what kind of symbols and meanings are within Yankton, what, I, what 
can we look to what symbol identifies Yankton? And then also at the end, we talk about the administrative topics, but I, I made sure to gloss over it. So the idea of the budget, how many city flags do we need? Uh, any wholesale uh, companies, is there anyone in Yankton that could potentially make flags for us? Those are some things that we should be talking about now, but also if we end up going with the study committee of community leaders, they will take a part in that as well to discuss what options the city of Yankton has. So at the end, I wanted to bring up the uh, state of South Dakota flag, and I just wanted to ask you all if you think that this is a good flag or not, based on what we learned about state seals. So on the flag, you can see that South Dakota is mentioned twice uh, on the seal, and then also, uh, as you can see, Mount Rushmore State, South Dakota. It, it's going to be hard for them to go through a redesign effort, but I think it's just kind of a, an understanding to see that if you fail one of the major principles, and you can see with the first principle, which is keeping it simple, it's impossible to think that a third grader would be able to redraw the state seal. So I think uh, going based off of that, and then also on the previous slide, we had the city of Sioux Falls flag, and then also the city of Brandon flag. Uh, it shows that through a process that might be tumultuous, there might be ups and downs, but in the end, if we do it the right way, I think it will resonate well with the city of Yankton, but also have something that can last a while that represents our city so that when people come here, they can understand what the underlying meanings of the city are on the flag, but also those in Yankton can help to kind of contribute to that education by showing you know, what makes Yankton unique. So that is the end of the presentation. Any questions? Um, I have one, and it's uh, related to the presentation here. Thank you for pulling this together. Oh, yeah, no um, is there anything, or I didn't hear any mention of the actual like size of the flag, and maybe in the presentation, it's just the way the flags were put on the presentation we got here. It looks like some are more, a little bit more square, some are a little bit more oblong. I think there were some that had like a cutout or anything. Did you find anything in your research that talks about more of a geometrical design to it? For the flag, on the podcast, it actually references the size of the flag. Uh, I think it was a three by five, five, three feet by five feet size flag. And then also, if just like a basic no, uh, note card is how you design the flag. So that's pretty much, from 100 feet from here, that's like basically the size of the, size of the flag would be the note card. So. But if you had cutouts or like some of them had like a V cutout or something mm -hmm. like that, they don't really say anything against that? I was just curious. Um, I don't, I mean, from what I've seen, I don't believe so, so. So have you thought about how we determine whether there's community interest? Do we, do you think we start exactly. the committee or do we, um, do we open up invitations to the mm -hmm. committee, see if people are interested in being a part of it and go from there? Yeah, I think that, that, that'll be something we do in later towards the last part of spring towards the summer. But I think the first part is kind of the public outreach of us going out to the radio talk shows or getting the social media outreach just to see you know, what interests are out there. And then after that, if we see that there are community leaders out there, like if the Yankton Area Arts really wants to take this project, if the Meridians Arts Council wants to focus on this, I think that's when we start doing the letter of intent or, or the letter of interest form, submitting that in the city department just to have that community outreach, that community study committee. So I think the first thing will be the social media outreach. So. At the end of the day, though, you would recommend that the city commission is the one that officially approves the flag? Yeah. At, uh, well, Sioux Falls, I think they did a great job of adding in community uh, participation. So when they did the flag design efforts at the beginning, they fielded those, uh, those different flag designs. And then they had a panel of community, uh, community jurors that came in and kind of voted on that. So I think that might be the best way instead of having a bunch of flag designs that only the commissioners can have their say on which flag is best. For I guess people. maybe a better way to put it, we would officially adopt the flag yep. versus select yep. it. Yeah, that is correct, yeah. So do you have um, a timeline in mind for, for what you think would be ideal? Um, I did make a timeline. We, uh, we didn't want to get too in depth on what we wanted to get into, but again, it ranges anywhere from a few months to a couple of years. So it all goes back to the idea of community participation. If we can't get the interest right away, then it'll be a longer process for us. But as long as we start it sooner than, rather than later, then I think it'll be a quicker process for us. So. How's the commission feeling about this? Are you excited? Scared? <laughs> I think this is extremely exciting. Um, for a long time, we've been talking about branding for the city and trying to find something that unites us all because we all seem to run in different directions. So 
I think if we can make this happen, this could be a great thing for the community and something for us all to take pride in. Yeah, I like it. I learned a lot about flags tonight. That's interesting. <laughs> uh, and I did Google the South Dakota state flag right away and saw that, yeah, that doesn't meet any of the recommendations. Um, I think it'd be a great idea and getting the community involved to help pick it and make it simple like that. You know, I think about the Chicago one, right? There's two lines and then four stars. Well, if you're not from there and you weren't involved, would you know what those stars meant? So there's, you still got to have something to explain it to the explain people, it. right? Yep. But I understand you wouldn't have uh, any verbiage underneath their letters, but um, that's pretty neat. Yeah, I would echo what we've heard here so far. I think this presents an exciting opportunity to create something that people can rally around, rally under, when we have important issues facing our community. And if it looks anything like that Amsterdam flag, I thought that was pretty <laughs> cool. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see if we can round up some community support. So you're suggesting from here, uh, with commission support, you would start doing some outreach efforts or collectively yeah. we would start doing some outreach efforts mm -hmm. yeah I, I mentioned the idea of going on a radio talk show and I think uh, Amy and I have been discussing it previously so we'd be able to set that up and then also we can also do Twitter and Facebook posts as well just to gauge the, the public's interest so I think that that'll be that's the official start is doing that right away and seeing what comes in for the city so and then also we've got Carter's little sisters designs already that we'd like to see <laughs> So. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. I, I see a lot of possibilities with it. Of course, I like the Milwaukee flag, so I'm probably out for designing it. <laughs> we do have a couple of members of the public here this evening. Is there anything you would like to share with the commission? If so, please step to the podium. Thank you, Jane. I'm excited about listening to the information presented about a, a flag for Yankton. I think it's an absolutely outstanding idea, and I would be willing to help serve on this committee, and I also would like to contribute the name of a group that I belong to called Connecting Artists and um, maybe offer their help as well. Thank you. Quick question, Car uh, Carter. You might have mentioned this beginning, and I um, forgot it already. But is that what you imagine? Just what we saw? Very simple. Yeah. Very. Is that what you've seen from your sister drawing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is there are there any more commission questions or commission discussion? Jolly, is there any more you wanted to add? No, I think that was all I had okay. on my end, so. I think that video was very helpful to all of us and provided some humor, which we all appreciate, on a topic like vexillology. <laughs> I just wonder how long you practiced saying that. Uh, today was my first attempt. Well, over the weekend. Okay. But I didn't look it up, I guess, and I, I guess correctly, believe it or not. Um, so yeah, I, I think what we, from what we've heard here tonight, let's proceed and see what the community tells us. Right. I have a feeling they'll be excited about it too. So if there's no further discussion, I would ask for a motion to adjourn until our regular session at 7 p.m. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Is anyone opposed? This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>